a healthy brain is a plastic brain. To be specific, it's a brain with the optimal amount of plasticity. What does that exactly mean? And why should it matter to all of us as we go through a life aiming to function best and minimize the risk of illness? The human brain is made out of highly specialized, exquisitely built cells, neurons, we call them, supported by a whole host of other very specialized brain cells called glia. These brain cells, each one of them has a different configuration and a different function. Functions that have been developed over many, many thousands of years of evolution. Brain cells are highly specific and specialized. And because of that, they're also highly resistant to any change. They do what they do. It's very difficult to recover them from doing something else if they are not doing it well. We have building blocks that are explicitly built for a given purpose and do that very well. But one drawback of such a specialized system is that it could potentially be a very inflexible system. It could be a very a system that is very dependent on a given setting or circumstance. And yet, the world we live in, the monitoring of our own body that the brain has to do, and the relationship and understanding of the world we navigate and act upon requires a very different system, a much more flexible system. We live in a world that is continuously changing. We live in a world that faces us with challenges we cannot anticipate from one moment to the other. Just the recent past uh, of, of uh, humanity uh, dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic illustrates the fact that things we cannot really anticipate end up having enormous impact on us. And our brains are challenged continuously to cope with these unexpected events. That requires a system that is able to respond quickly, flexibly to novel situations. When my um, parents were growing up, they couldn't conceive of a way to communicate with each other via mobile uh, telephones, leave alone having basically all your memory and knowledge in these little gizmos that I cannot live without. And I'm, I'm a, you know, an amateur compared with my children. So our brain made up of this exquisitely specific and sophisticated brain cells that are very fixed in what they do is challenged and required to adapt and react to a very, very rapidly changing world. And the solution of nature to do that is what we call plasticity. And it's played out in plasticity because these elements, these brain cells are connected with each other in networks, and those networks are flexible, are continuously adapting, are capable of change. Those networks are nature's solution to the fact that the brain has to cope with a rapidly changing world. And they are therefore intrinsically modifiable. They are continuously changing. And that raises a different challenge the challenge of how quickly, how effective should plasticity be, and what are the opportunities to monitor and to modify that plasticity. The notion, the concept of plasticity, that very idea was first introduced by Williams James, a psychologist, and he introduced it referring to habits, to behavior, not to brain per se. It was Ramon y Cajal, the Spanish neuroscientist, who took that notion of plasticity and explored it, put it into neurobiology, 
And so now today we talk about these networks, these connections of brain cells, each one of which is specialized for a given behavior. Every thought we have, every perception, every emotion, every plan, everything we do, literally everything that our brain does is mapped onto a specific network. And that network is modifiable and changing and capable of adapting. Plasticity, therefore, is not something we can switch on and off, is not something that is good or bad per se, is something that is always there, is the very way our brain works. And the challenge is to guide it. The challenge is to promote those changes that benefit us and suppress those that do not. Plasticity is the substrate for learning and acquiring new things, is the source of creativity and ingenuity of humankind, but is also the very substrate of the symptoms of disease and disabilities. As a neurologist then, as a neuroscientist, I want to understand the, um, the substrates, the makings and the workings of that plastic brain network and brain. But as a neurologist, I want to guide the plasticity. I want to guide it for the benefit of individual patients. And in order to do that, we need to be able to translate the insights from animal studies into human. We need to be able to measure the efficacy of plasticity. And we need to not only characterize the consequences of a plastic brain, but also measure how the plasticity is working, how much plasticity a given subject has, and ultimately be able to modulate it, to guide it for the benefit of the person. So those are the challenges we face, and they're important challenges because just like Williams James originally pointed out, the brain has to be capable of this plastic change that he spoke about for the first time, but it needs the right amount of plasticity. It is bad if the brain has too much plasticity, it's too easy to be modified, but it is also bad if the brain is not plastic enough. We need a brain and we, in, in healthy situations, have a brain that has the optimal amount of plasticity that yields to influence, but doesn't yield all at once. Perhaps one thing that is worth talking about first is what are the extent or examples or illustrations of that plasticity in the brain at, at work? Um, when we acquire the ability to do individual movements of the fingers, when somebody becomes a pianist, and has exquisite control of those finger movements, that is possible. That skill, like every other human skill, is possible, thanks to the fact that those networks that control the finger movements get modified. And that happens at enormous fast time course. It, it very quickly ensembles groups of neurons start working differently as a team to be able to do a given task differently. It's a substrate of learning and acquisition of skills for the human brain. We've known that for a very long time. In fact, Cajal anticipated that in his in description of the fact that neurons, because of their connections, would provide the substrate for every human capacity and ability. But the range of examples of plasticity is, is much greater than we had initially thought of, at least that I had initially thought of. It, for example, a lot of our brain, a lot of our human brain is devoted to process visual information. About two thirds of the brain cortex has something to do with vision. It, and so, I became interested a number of years ago in the question of what happens to the brain when 
one is born without vision or when one loses the, the sense of vision. What happens to that real estate of the brain, it is unlikely that it would not be doing anything. And in fact, what we now know is that the same way as very rapidly, the coordination of fingers changes when you acquire the ability to play the piano, the same way that that happens very, very quickly, large distances of the brain are bridged to assign different tasks to parts of the brain that traditionally would be devoted to vision if one loses vision. And that happens at enormously fast speed too. If, for example, if one takes sighted individuals and blindfolds them, render, rendering them blind for just a few days, the parts of the brain in the back of the head, the back of the brain that would process vision start becoming engaged in perceiving touch or in hearing voices and remembering them or in detecting patterns of sounds or remembering words offered. In other words, in, in activities using other senses that overcome the limitations of the loss of vision. The extent of brain connections that must be reshaped in their function to enable that kind of a change, that kind of a plastic change, is much larger than what we had anticipated. And so it illustrates the fact that this capacity of the brain to be modified truly is an enormously powerful and, and capable tool for the brain to adapt to different circumstances. But it is a double-edged sword. It is also the case that the same capacity can underlie chronic pain, can underlie functional neurological disorders, can underlie dystonia and alterations of movements, can underlie ultimately cognitive problems or spasticity in the motor domain. So a lot of symptoms of disease that are very disabling are manifestations of that large scale change capacity of the brain. Now going beyond characterizing the consequences of plasticity is particularly important. One thing is to say the brain is plastic and here are examples of how the brain is modified when one has a lesion, when one has an illness, or when one learns new skills. A very different thing is to measure and characterize how effective are the mechanisms of plasticity themselves. How capable is a brain to be modified in meaningful ways? Measuring the efficacy of the mechanisms of plasticity is important and it is important because it allows us to ask the question of, do they change over a lifetime? Do they change in the setting of disease? Are certain illnesses manifestations of alterations of the mechanisms of disease? And perhaps more important than any of those, can we do something about the efficacy of the mechanisms of plasticity in a given individual to help him or her function better? Techniques to characterize the mechanisms of plasticity. So not just the consequences of plasticity, but the efficacy of the mechanisms themselves have been adapted from animal models to humans. And we now have tools that are non-invasive, for example, transcranial magnetic stimulation a way to perturbate specific parts of the brain and capture the response to that perturbation that allows us to measure and characterize the efficacy of the mechanisms of plasticity in human individuals. Young children all the way to older adults, healthy individuals, as well as those with illness. And we can do those measures for different parts of the brain and even explore different types of mechanisms of plasticity, those that potentiate connections and those that suppress or reduce efficacy of connections. Thanks to those studies, 
we now know that the efficacy of the mechanisms of plasticity normally goes down with age. As we get older, plasticity remains, but it takes more input, more repetition to be able to secure and implement the change. Again, this is a double-edged sword. It makes it harder to develop new skills, but it also makes it harder to develop problems of disease because the brain is less, less easy to be modified in a lasting way. We also know that there are illnesses that have a core alteration in the mechanisms of plasticity that appears to be the critical component that leads to pathology. For example, in dementia of Alzheimer's disease type, the mechanisms of plasticity are suppressed. It takes too long for the brain to acquire new habits and to develop new skills. It is possible, but it's fundamentally altered and it's so it's altered in that way very early on the disease. On the other hand, in illnesses like autism spectrum disorder, the mechanisms of plasticity are hyperactive. The brain is too easy to be modified. And the brain that is too plastic ends up being a noisy system because it's influenced in a lasting way by too many things that don't really matter. So we have ways to identify alterations of mechanisms of plasticity as the core problem in illness. And the final point I'd like to make is that we also have now tools to not just measure, but to modify the plasticity, not just to characterize it, but to modulate it, to make a hyperplastic brain or a hyperplastic network in the brain less effective in its plasticity, less likely to be modified or vice versa, to try to increase the likelihood of modification of systems that are hypoplastic. That allows us to ultimately reduce the risk of disability, promote a healthier functioning of individual brains, and approach therapeutics in a very different way. Approach therapeutics by characterizing in a precision mode specific alterations of brain network dynamics and modulating those brain circuits to make them function in a more adaptive way. The remarkable thing is that when one does that, because of the very plasticity of the system, interventions can lead to lasting benefits and therefore open up the door to prevention, to minimization of disability, and ultimately to better, healthier, brain for all of us as we age.